I'm on. I believe, this is what I believe. I believe there's a whole bunch of people out there that they're being deceived. And we, we know them. Jesus said, you know, uh, people that proclaim to be a believer, uh, you'll know them by their fruits. And so fruits is where uh, our interest is and how we allow the, de the development of God's character in our lives. And, uh, and so uh, I felt led to do this uh, for us here, but also for the people listening online, because it's very important to know if you are a truly a genuine believer. How many, do, don't, how many here don't like being deceived? I include it. I don't like being deceived, right? And so uh, there's two things in life that the, more the most important thing there is. The first thing is salvation, right? Salvation is probably the one thing, because we all are born and we all have a time to die. And in, in the meantime, during that time that we're living, we have to find the truth. And what is the truth? Well... The major truth is that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us to give us eternal life. Of all the things that a human being could ever do in life is to make the right choice. And the right choice, you know, I see people in the past preparing for retirement. But the biggest retirement is the longest retirement there is because it's eternal. And it's about who, what are you, what are you doing with Jesus? What is, uh, are you living for him? And so, unfortunately, uh, there's many uh, that call themselves Christians, uh, but yet they would never were a Christian. And it's sad to, do, to know, but it's true. And so, uh, the title of this message is called, How Does One Become a Christian? Because, you know, let's face it. Let's face it. Many people believe that, they believe this, they are born in a Christian family, you know, a different denomination. There's many denominations. And then they think that uh, because of that, I automatically am a Christian. Well, that's far from being the truth. And so the question is, how do you become a Christian? Because, you know, there's only one truth. And so uh, last week I started with that. I started with the fact that you have to be born again. And unfortunately, there's many people out there that are uh, because of they weren't shown or uh, maybe their denomination doesn't use the word born again, uh, they think it's a church, they think it's denomination, some think it's a cult, some think this and that. And so I've proven what I was shouted out in John chapter 3, if they would just read the word of God, and there's many places, that Jesus said you have to be born again, born of the Spirit. And it's a supernatural thing that happens. You can't make it happen. And so uh, I kind of share that. Also, you have to repent. You know, many claim they're Christian, but they, they never repent. Repentant means it's the first thing. You see yourself as a sinner, and you want, to, you, want, you want out of that. You see what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the price, the tremendous price. His blood shed for us. And when you see that and you come to a place of understanding what the gospel message means, then the person, the sinner, should cry out to God and say, God, I want you in my life. I want to serve you. I want to give it all to you. And that's how you get born again. You get born again by uh, being, being under the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit uh, makes sure that you see yourself as a sinner. And when you do, then out of, the, out of your heart comes a cry to God, whether it's because you're in a church or you're whatever, and then you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. And like Jesus says, you know, it's a supernatural thing. He says the wind blows, you don't know where it's going, but that's how you get born again. Suddenly, because of your heart of compassion for the truth, your heart that really wants to serve God, God the Father knows that, sends his spirit. And supernaturally, behind the scene, you can't see it happen. The Holy Spirit comes whoosh, comes and lives inside a human heart. And it's called a new birth. It's called being born again. It's bo called born anew, a new creation. It's got all kinds of names in the New Testament. 
but it also means the same thing as that God comes and lives in you, which is almost art to grasp, but that's how it works. You can't see it. And then you have a hunger to serve God. And then what I did last Sunday also, I shared how, how do you know if you're born again? Well, do you love God? One of the true way of knowing, of knowing if you truly are a genuine believer is that you live for Him. And you watch over what you say, what you think, what you do. That's a test for you to know. And Jesus says there's only two commandments to follow. You shall love the Lord our God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If this is what motivates you daily, that means you're on the right track. If not, then there's a problem. So I shared that last week. That uh, uh, loving God, His key to know that if you're a truly genuine believer. And, and so we start pleasing God instead of ourself. And so, uh, uh, and so I, uh, I shared about salvation. I shared many things. But today I want to share something very, very different. You know, I know without a shadow of doubt, when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, your past sins are erased. That, that's true, 100%. You start a brand spanking new life in Christ. That means everything you did, what you did, whatever, bad or good, everything, everything is under the blood. But after that, there comes the life of living in the Spirit. And so, I want to share a little bit about, sometimes, you know, uh, many people have a hard time understanding uh, the fight of faith that we have to go through. And some explain it with different words, but I'm going to explain it a little bit different. I'm going to explain to you and prove you to by the Word of God. Uh, no, I, this was not taught by me, I must, uh, by someone. I got it by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the thing is, I found it very intriguing that uh, Paul talks about it, but also we can find it in Genesis. In Genesis, at the fall of man. And so, I, I just want to start with this this morning. All mankind became sinners at the fall of man. Everybody agree with this? Right? So, you know, in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve, and then Satan came and tempted. And there was two trees in the garden. There was the, the tree uh, of life, and there was the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you can't take or partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat its fruit, you will surely die. And so, uh, I can't prove this. But uh, Adam was temp uh, uh, Eve was tempted, and then Adam was tempted because of uh, his wife Eve. But anyway, they both ate of the fruit. And from that time on, sin entered the world. And so uh, that means that, and so they, then they saw themselves naked, and they tried to hide from God, and that's, that's in Genesis. That's the beginning of time, right? But note this. Uh, sin entered the world, and that means the character of the enemy. They were no longer innocent, and so the na sin nature entered humanity. And from then on, sin nature is in humanity. It cannot be reversed. It can be only dealt with by Jesus himself, by his uh, blood, by asking him in our life. And then he gives us legal, uh, um, he, he gives us power over sin. All mankind became sinners at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and partook of the forbidden fruit. Sin became alive inside them and from then on mankind were able to do evil by an inherited, inheriting Satan's character traits. Sin, sin was like a living force, living inside human beings that was not supposed to be in human beings. In the letter to Romans church, Paul describes it this way. In Romans 7, if you look at Romans chapter 7, it talks about sin. If you read the whole book of Romans, 
Uh, it talks about sin, it talks about salvation, it talks the whole enchilada. It's probably the most awesome book there is to understand sin, how it works, how it's dealt with, and what did J Jesus did. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 11, it says, Now know when I read it, you will understand that sin has a mind of its own. That means it's, it's something inside every human being that a human being has a hard time controlling because it seems to take hold of our hearts and our mind. And that's what Paul was saying. Since sin took advantage of those commands, it's talking about the uh, Ten Commandments, and deceived me, it used the commands to kill me. So right there we see that there is a battle within the heart of a human life, every human life, that the sin nature, sin entered humanity. Again, it, it, it came about in the beginning of time with Adam and Eve. In verse 18 it says, And I know that nothing good inside it lives in me, that is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. How is that? Well, it's because something happened in the beginning of time and when Adam and Eve disobeyed, there's kind of a, an entity, a something that entered. And sin has a mind. Uh, God in his word talks about sin like it has a mind of its own. And I want everybody to see this because uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you some more stuff about it. But let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 or 4. And so in Genesis chapter 4, we, we see that life started from, uh, now Adam had relation, uh, in Genesis 4, 1 it says, Now Adam had sexual relationship with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. That's after eating of the forbidden fruit, right? When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel when they grew up. Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. But he did not accept Cain. And his gift. Now know what happened here. Sin is crouching at the door of this man. This made Cain very angry. And he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? Now here we have a background scene on how sin works. Where you're angry at somebody jealous, whatever. And so it's like a, a, a controlling thing, a something. But the person has uh, two, two, ways of, two, two ways of dealing with that. And that's what it is with all of us. And so uh, in verse 7, it says, You will ex be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door. Now note what it says here. Eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain, so he didn't master it. What, what do you think happened? Well, because he allowed anger or the sin nature to take hold of him, one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out in the field, and while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed them. That is why Jesus came and died for our sin. He came to deliver from the power of sin. Not just past sin, but from the power of sin. And in the New Testament, even as a believer, we still have this, um, this thing. Again, I'm talking about, are you a Christian? And what is a Christian? A Christian is, 
a man or a woman, a child of God, a, a person that became born again, and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And then what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome sin. Can I have an amen for that? You know, Jesus came to give us power over sin. And so uh, that, that thing is the greatest thing there is because in the Old Testament, we see that Cain could not master that sin, that, that evil way of doing things. And so he killed his brother. That was the first murder there ever was, was when Cain killed his brother. And so, uh, so that's what he did. Now I wanted, I was reading in Galatians and God the Holy Spirit was just showing me a few things. One thing that he showed me, and I'm not going to go there this morning, but I was reading in, uh, chapter, uh, in Mark. You remember when, uh, um, just because I want to say his name there, he betrayed Jesus there, uh, Judas. So Judas there in the meeting, and the, uh, the woman with the alabaster jar, she, and uh, Judas was in charge of the banking, uh, the finances. And so uh, I, I don't want to go there because it's not part of my message, but uh, there's a part there where uh, uh, they're all angry because she, she wasted that, according to them, especially Judas. And so when Judas went to see to, uh, so anger got all of, uh, of Judas, and he went, and that's where he betrayed uh, Jesus. And uh, it says there in the Word, and I don't want to go there, but it says there, if you go, it says that, uh, you know, they, they, were, uh, they were amazed of why he came to them. Well, I believe it's because uh, Judas had anger, uh, and uh, sin was crouching on the door, and that's why he, he did that to Jesus. But also, we also know that he was predicted, it was predicted they would go that. But sin, I, I want to talk about the sin nature this morning. So in Galatians chapter 5, to prove what I'm talking about and how, so here Paul in Galatians to the Galatians, what is he saying? He says you have a choice. Even though your sins have been forgiven, you still will have to deal with that sin nature. Again, I say it again, sin has a mind of its own. If it wouldn't, uh, then he wouldn't speak about things like this. And he says this, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That's in uh, chapter 5, verse 16. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See again? Sin as a believer, a genuine believer, I'm talking about a Christian, a real Christian, will yield to the Holy Spirit, and there's always going to be that battle in us. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, know what it says here, this is the Word of God, these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intention. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, and then he lists a whole bunch, and I'm not going to read it, but there's so many. And so, uh, but though, uh, uh, then he, it lists the, the gifts, the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit. But all in all, what I want us to understand is that as a believer in the world without Christ, they don't have access to the Holy Spirit. We as believers, as, as, as believers, true genuine believers, born again, we decide who we're going to follow. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hopefully you're getting it. And so this fight, sometimes we wonder why are we doing or saying or you know, doing certain things. It's because there's a battle inside. And we as believers, true genuine Christians, we have to know this, very important that we know this, that there's a battle. And sin has a own voice. It has its own desire. And we will always have to fight. And we, uh, that's why the Holy Spirit, that's why Jesus gave us his spirit to be overcome sin. Hopefully uh, you get what I'm trying to say. 
So the mystery of Christianity. How do you get saved? How do we get saved? You know, many people profess being a believer, but how, how, how do you know you're a believer? Did you apply, like here, uh, we call it the Roman road. And so the Roman, I don't know, I believe, this is what I believe, the book of Romans is probably the most, when somebody gets to become a new believer, it's the most important book, that and the book of John, because you need to know how God loves you, Jesus loves you. But this, the, the other one is the book of Romans, because the book of Romans will, would, will show us the sin and uh, will show us uh, everything that's against God and it will also show us how to get saved. So I just want to read this and uh, sometimes we call it the Roman road. And so the mystery of Christianity. Again, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a kingdom. It's, it's to follow God and God sees you and it's supernatural. Being a Christian is supernatural. Uh, you can't explain it, but it's, it's not something that you go and take a course. It's something that you love God and God shows his love for you and you feel him and you desire to live for him because he makes himself real to you and you feel his love for you and all these things are all part of becoming a true genuine believer. It's not something you just uh, did in lip service. You mean it and you, you desire to serve him right up to the end of your life, and that's what a true Christian is. It must be noted that true Christian is a supernatural intervention from heaven by Almighty God. It's not a religion, it's a kingdom with the birth of its citizens by heaven itself and for the heaven bound, for the heaven world. So here how a genuine believer will uh, be faced with the reality of what Jesus did for us and I call it and we all call it uh, the Roman road so the first thing a person does is Romans chapter 3 verse 10 we're going to go a little bit in Romans there this morning it says there as the scripture says no one is righteous this means no one is perfect so it's the first thing to know you're a perfect good Things that you do in life is not enough to make you go to heaven, right? So you have to come to that realization that you're not good enough. Many people say, well, you know, that person was a good person, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but yet you yeah, still have to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Because, you know, there was good people. That means that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for nothing. You know why? Because there was many good people in the times of Jesus. And there's still many people today... And they think because of their goodness, they value, they look at that, well, you know, I had a good life, uh, God's going to allow me to heaven. No. Did you receive Jesus as your Lord? Is, does, is his, that, has his blood washed you? Have you been forgiven? Are you living for him? That's the greatest thing there is. So, no one is righteous. Not one. Then, in verse 3, chapter 3, Romans 3, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So, we can't do it on our own. Next, where did sin come from? Again, I shared with that. Romans 5, 10, 12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death, death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Adam was the first person that was created by God, sin and passed sin to onto every human being. And I covered that. I already spoke about sin. I told you how sin has a mind of its own. It seems to be alive. And even though we're born again believers, we will always fight against this thing that wants to do its own. We call it the, the old nature, the carnal nature, whatever. We will always, always be in battle as believers. And we have to yield to the Holy Spirit and then we can overcome these things, these temptations, because God's Spirit lives in us. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying here, because that's how it works. That fight will be on right up to the end of our life. That's how, uh, that's what the true Christian life is all about. What do we deserve for our sin? Romans 6, 
23. For the wages of sin is dead, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, only through Jesus can we make it. Because of our sin, we are supposed to die and be separated from God forever and headed for hell instead of heaven. But because of what Jesus did, we're not going there if you receive you, uh, Him as Lord and Savior. Who paid the price for his sin? Again, the Roman road, right? Romans 8, 5, 8. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we are still sinners. Instead of us dying, Jesus died in our place in order to give us eternal life with Him in heaven. He paid the price. What is the way out? How do I get saved? Romans chapter 10 verse 9. This is how... Now I'm talking about how to become a genuine Christian. Very important for those listening that this is the only way to become a true genuine Christian. You are not a Christian because you were born in a Christian family. You are not, you are not a Christian because of a certain denomination, blah, blah, blah. No, you are you're a Christian by how you respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. In Romans 9.10, it says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a knack from your own heart to God, and God sees if you're serious or not. It's not a formula, but if your heart feels, uh, you feel like, Wow, I didn't know that. Well, even now, if I'm speaking to people behind the camera. If you haven't done that, do it now. Because it says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, meaning you're, you want Him as your Lord, the master of your life, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved instead. And then it says in verse 10, For it is by believing your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And that's the born-again experience. That's when it happens. When you do that, when every, any person on planet Earth does that, and they're genuinely sincere before God, this is the only way to heaven. This is the only way to get to be saved, this is the only way to become a true, genuine believer is when you do that. God cannot be mocked. It's not attending church and, you know, telling God, you know, I, I go to church once in a while, blah, 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 I'm a good person. No, you have to declare to God that Jesus is Lord of your life. And you have to mean it. And then you repent of your sin and you decide to live for Him. That's the only way you become a genuine Christian. There's no other way. I'm sorry for, you know, there's denomination that say, no, no, you were baptized, blah, blah. No, you're, no, 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 no. You have to decide on your own that you want to serve Jesus. It, will, it can't be done for you. Your parents can't do it for you. You have to decide. You have to be convicted that you are a sinner. You need a Savior. And you see what Jesus did for you on the cross. And your heart cries out to God. And you claim and you invite Him. And it's not even a formula. Because many, many churches, they do altar calls. And people come in. And they do there. They go there. And they say these words after me. You know. And you, well, if you don't mean it, it, there's just lip service. It's just lip service. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? To become a genuine believer, you have to be sincere with God. You have to be sincere. You have to do it because your heart is broken. Because you want, really want to serve Him. That's the only way to become a Christian. And there's many people out there that claim to be a Christian and you are not a Christian. You didn't mean when you said the sinner's prayer. It has to be said behind a pulpit because it's not a formula. And people think it's a formula. Oh, I did the sinner's prayer when I was young. Or I did this, you know. But if, did you mean it? Was your heart broken before God? Did you apply the scriptures what I, I read to you in Romans? Did you see yourself as a sinner? It's the only way. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. In Matthew chapter 5, I think. 
Mourn means to grieve inside and say, God, I need you more than anything else. I see that I am, I, 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 I'm not going to make it if I don't have you in my life. That's how you become a believer. It's the only way. God can be mocked. God can see, can know the thoughts. You think you're hiding from God. You can't hide from God. The Word of God is active like a two-headed sword, priest or bones and marrows, knowing the intentions of the heart, separating the, the mind from the spirit. He knows everything. He knows the hair of our body. He knows our past, present, and future. He knows what we're going to say before we speak. The Bible is very clear. God knows everything. He goes inside every human being. He knows them by name. He knows them. He created them. And you can't hide from him. He hates hypocrites. And let me tell you, there's a lot of hypocrites. There's a lot of people that proclaim they're believers, yet they're not. They act like the devil. Jesus says, you shall know them by their fruits. This is serious stuff. I don't know why God wanted me to do this. But all I, want, I know is that truth sets people. Like I said earlier, there's two things. Salvation and truth. What is true? Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of people out there, they claim to be a believer, and they are not. And they need to know it so that they can turn around. Because God's heart is calling out. Get serious with God. We're living in times, it's no time to play game. It's no time to play game. We never know when Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back for his church. Did you know that? Only those who are on fire for God will make it. Only those... They're called by God. They live for Him. They, for some, they look like fools. They call it crackpots, you know, all these, you know, whatever. But the thing is, that's what the Bible calls us to do, to live for Him, to go all the way. What's the purpose of going part of the way? I did a sermon, a few sermons there. Did you count the costs? When you decide to follow God, expect things to happen. And the enemy won't like you. And he will try, tooth and nail, to try to... To create, a, to, to affect your faith. But you need to stay faithful to the end. And verse 13 it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus is the only way out. He said this, Jesus says this. In John 14, 6, Jesus said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's no other door to heaven. There's no other religion to heaven. I'm sorry, but there's none. Only Jesus, He is the door. So how can I get out? Admit that you are a sinner, right? First. Believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead. Repent of your sins and confess with your mouth that you accept Jesus as your Lord in your life. And if you sincerely do that, I am telling you, I will always remember when I got saved. I did not know what happened to me. I turned from one day to the other. Uh, me was the swearing, went away the next day. I couldn't, I couldn't, I said something happened to me. I didn't know. I didn't know what born again was. I didn't know nothing. All I know is that God changed my heart, changed my mind, my desires changed totally. After a while, I had to throw all my, all my uh, booze and after a while, my drugs and all that. All, the, all these things I, had no more hold on me. Why? Because God took hold of me. It's supernatural. Like, you know, I can't explain it. But that's what it is to become a Christian. After that, the power that's, oh, that sin has over you loses its, its control. And so then there's a fight. In Romans chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Oh, what miserable person I am. Again, speaking of sin, and I explained to you that sin has a voice of its own. It, has, it wants its own desire in our hearts. Even though we're saved, we will have that fight. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Verse 25, thank God. Here's the answer. The answer is in, in Jesus Christ our Lord, meaning in Him. 
So you see how it is, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. In Romans 8, 1, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. Now, know what it says here in verse 2. Again, I'm explaining the reason that God gave, Jesus gave us his spirit. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, this is key here, verse 2. And because you belong to him, the power, or some version, Bible version, the law of this life-giving spirit has freed you from the power or the law now, I know what I'm saying here of sin that leads to death. So the spirit is a law and sin is a law. The spirit has a voice. Sin has a voice. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? You need a law to overcome another law. You need a power. It says how... The, the word here, I think it's, it says power. The law, uh, you have it in, an, uh, what version is that there? Okay. The NLT says, and because you belong to him, the power or the law, but I like the law better because the law is something that it's in motion. It's something that cannot be changed. So what the Spirit of God is saying through Paul here in Romans is saying is this. Because you received Jesus as Lord, now that sin nature in you that wants to take over, I've given you a law, the law of the spirit of life, to overcome the law of sin and death. So in a human being, in a believer, a genuine believer, there will always be this fight. And we have to yield to the Holy Spirit all the time. That's what it says in Galatians. Galatians said says almost the same, same thing. But we have to understand what sin is. We have to understand what Jesus came to give inside of us. And the only, you see, in, in the Word it says that uh, uh, when we get our new body, that sin nature will not be there anymore. That's why we need a new body too, right? And, but in here on the earth, we will all ha always have that fight. But we, if we yield to the Holy Spirit all the time, we won't, it will come naturally. The enemy, the, the sin nature will try to overrule. And so I, I, I remember years ago, I, I read the book Watchman Lee. It's called The Spirit Man. Let me tell you, that is this guy he lived 100 years ago, but he was in prison. And because he was in prison, the Holy Spirit showed him this, showed him. So I only read right to that. After a while, I was overwhelmed. But that's what he says. He's trying to explain. And so a lot of Christians, a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers, I don't know why they don't see this, but it's, 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 it's not just our past sin is erased. Yes. But also we will have to deal with this. That's why some people, they, they start good, but they finish bad, right? They, they're in love with God, but suddenly that, that, that the sin nature overrules and they start living a life, a life that they were supposed to get out of and then they finish their race lukewarm or, uh, you know, to, in, in, anyway, it's, uh, uh, it's not good. So a genuine Christian, I'm talking about genuine Christian, this, you have to expect this fight all the time. Right? And so I read it again so that we can all get it. And because you belong to him, belong to Jesus, the power or the law of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of our weakness of our sinful nature. It's talking about the Ten Commandments. Impossible to follow. You need God's help to follow them. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own body and son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sin. Now, did you understand? Did you, 
Did you pay attention? Sins control over you. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us. We no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. I'm reading very slow because I really want people to pay attention. You, sometimes you wonder, why, this, why am I thinking like that? Why do I want to do and, you know, revenge or do something? It's because that sinful nature wants you to go back to your old ways. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit will say, no, don't go that. You remember, you have to love your neighbors, you love yourself, you know, your love, you know. And so that's, that's a fight inside of us. Do you understand what it is? This is very important for people, even people that, especially people are baby believers, because you will have that fight inside of you. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that there's a battle inside you. And it's normal. And so then in verse 4 it says, He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about t sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that pleases the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. This is what the Christian life is all about. It's this thing. And the more you're in love with Jesus, the more you have interaction with Him, the more all this, you will just automatically not even pay attention to that sinful nature, that sinful mindset, that old carnal nature. You will just be in love with God and do it because you love God and it will come like natural for you to just follow the Spirit instead of the sinful nature. Verse 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And we have a whole multitude of people up there they call themselves Christians and yet they never were a Christian. They don't have the Holy Spirit to help them overcome sin. That's why there's no change. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die. Now know what it says here. This is the one I want. And though your body will die because of sin. Meaning that body here. Whatever that sin looks like. I don't know if it's. I don't know, it's, not, it's got a mind of its own. I can't explain it, but because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been right made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal body by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, and so note what it says here. Paul, still speaking, Romans eight twelve. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to Christians here, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You have no obligation. You, you don't have to follow that, he's saying. For if you live, now note, you choose. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. That means you will die eternally. You will lifeless and Unfortunately, I believe it means hell. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. You know, people think, you know, once, you once saved, always saved. No. The real, the real time you're going to be completely saved is when you finish your last breath. And if you live for God, you love Him with all your heart. You watch over yourself. It doesn't mean you don't fall. It doesn't mean you don't fail. But you repent right away. And your desire is always to please God. Even though at times it might fail Him. Your heart is pure. You really want to serve you. You want to finish your race for it. And you finish your race even though you know you made some mistakes. But you know you, de you die loving God and still faithful to Him. That's when you fully get saved. 
The Bible is very clear on that. I could bring you multitudes of scriptures, but it's not true, once saved, always saved. No. There's so many warnings. Hebrews, Peter. Here it's very clear if you desire. You can be saved and God gives you his spirit and then you decide to live like the devil and then you think you're going to go to heaven. God cannot allow contamination in heaven. Do you understand that? He cannot allow that. So how does one become a true Christian? Again, Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how does that message get about? Well, glad you asked. It comes when you share the gospel, you personally or a minister in front, and this is how it's made. So that's why it's important. Jesus says, go in all the world, and what did he say? Preach the gospel, right? The good news. The things that we try to share, people saying, oh, get away with your God, blah, blah. You don't understand what those people, oh, don't stay away from me. I don't want to hear about you. Well, you know, that's the price to pay. But that's the news that we want to share and to bring. Because, you know, I remember when I first got saved, I turned into uh, John Higgy. I turned into a, a Hell's Bells type of preacher. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I made major damage to the people because I, didn't sh I, I shared truth. But there's a way of sharing truth. Right? And I was afraid of all my the people I loved, they were going to hell. But the thing is, it was, you know, so I made major damage. But the thing is, we as believers, this is all, when you get saved, the first thing you want to know, is, do is to, well, you got to get your family saved, your friends saved, because I didn't know about this, and I was going to hell. I didn't know I was going there. I didn't know I was wrong. I didn't know. And Jesus paid the price, and I received him. And now, wow, my eyes are open, spiritual. I can read the word. It makes sense to me. I got to go and share that. But then, God has to make a role for you, right? A, a, an open door for you, right? But that's something, that's why some people say uh, they think we're crazy. But the thing is, it's because we know the truth. The truth has set us free, and we want to set others free, Right? So how does the gospel message is shared? Well, in verse 14, answer that. It says here, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? So I'm speaking to whatever, who, whoever's behind the camera. This is what I'm doing. I'm doing exactly what I'm reading here. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how is in, will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And that is why the scripture says, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. God sends people to share the good news. That's how it happens. That's why we exist. That's why we're on live. That's why we're... Uh, you know, because we know the Word of God. Once you know the Word of God, it's very hard not to be afraid of other people's soul. And you, you, you have to use wisdom. Lord, is it time? Can I share this? And, anyway, and so your heart is broken before God because you don't want anybody to perish, right? So Romans 7, uh, 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing that is hearing the good news about Christ. So that's how people get saved. They have to learn. They have to. Somebody has to have shared the good news of Christ with them. It's not by being a good person. Romans 11, 6 says this. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. Meaning you can't buy your way to heaven. That is like the, the biggest lie there is. And for in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So that's how you get saved. And that's how you stay saved is to know that there's a sin nature. You know, again, I'm talking to what it is to become, how do you become a truly Christian, a real Christian, and now to stay 
true faithful to the end and understand that there's a battle inside of us all the time I fight that battle if you see you're not fighting that battle well I bear to defer we all fight we all fight and now hopefully everyone list that has listened you will understand why it's at times it's so hard it's because that old nature which seems to be alive by what the Word of God says in, in Galatian, in, uh, in Genesis, and in, in Romans, that sin has a voice. Sin has a power. And you need power to overcome power. And the power of the Spirit can make you uh, come against the power of sin and death. Do you understand? It's a fight to the end. It will always be there. You can't get out of it. That's what it is to become and to be a genuine believer. A genuine believer will understand that there is a fight. That's why Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. It's because there is a fight. And the enemy is there. He tempts us. He sends all kinds of things. You know, Especially in the days we're living. We have access to things on the media like... You know, sometimes, you know, pornography, I remember when I, before I got saved, pornography uh, was, uh, you had to go to a store and rent it. It was like, uh, you really had to be an adult. Well, now you can actually, uh, kids can look at stuff on, on media now. You know, it's every, everything, everything is there. It's sin. Uh, the enemy is, is turning the knob, it seems, and to draw people to live a sinful lifestyle and even for Christians, if you don't watch yourself, if you don't have a, a strong uh, intimacy with God and reading His Word, and the Word changing you, changing you, I'm telling you, you can actually uh, be lured, slowly be lured back to your whole lifestyle. Because of what? Because of that sin, that sin nature. God gave us power over sin. He gave us His Spirit to overcome to live the good life, to feel His love for you, to make it to heaven, to live with Him forever. He, that's His desire. You know, no wonder the Bible says it's the greatest gift there is. It's the Holy Spirit. He's just your helper, your comforter. He's everything. He's the one makes the, the, word, the, the, real, the, the word real. He's the one that actually helps me to preach. The anointing. The, uh, he, he's everything. He does everything. The Holy Spirit. We can't see Him. But he lives in us as a believer, and now also he empowers us. And so how to stay safe, and I close with this. In Romans eleven twenty one, it says, For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust his kindness. But if you stop trusting you also will be cut off. He's giving a warning to the church. You know. So I'm going to finish for now, and I'm going to finish this uh, part three series because hopefully I finish it next week. But I have a, another part to share about uh, the life of a believer according to uh, Mark chapter 4. And... Uh, it talks about the seed in the ground, four types of soil, uh, four types of people listening, four types of focus. And then uh, what happens uh, when uh, uh, someone is very sincere, uh, the importance of reading the word. I'm talking about uh, true believers and how the word changes us. We go to bed, we wake up, Slowly, we're, our, our minds has changed, our heart changes, our, our focus changes, and, uh, and then later how we, um, we, can, uh, we get to a place where God has us, when, where he can use us to touch human lives. And so uh, I'm talking about uh, Mark chapter 4, the whole parable, if you read, and I, we're going we're to read it next Sunday, and I want to share God's heart with it. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus shared what it is to start, how to become a Christian, and also uh, how the Word will transform you, and then the latter part, how He can now be able to use you 
to love people, and start mission stuff or whatever, but to touch human lives for him. So uh, hopefully you will join next Sunday. Uh, Sunday I will conclude this message. But now what was important this morning is that you understand that there is sin has a voice. I, I haven't heard many uh, preachers talk about that, but sin has a voice. It, it does has. I was telling Helen even that yesterday. I, I don't know, sometimes, you know, when I believe this, and I'm not saying I know everything. I know this about God. If you ask God, you say, Lord, I only want to know the truth and know only the truth. It doesn't mean I did. I was not, uh, I was not uh, used and, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, uh, and there's a cost. And, uh, it doesn't mean that I follow truth all the time, but my desire and your desire, our desire should always be, Lord, please just bring me to the truth. And if your, your desire is sincere with God, God will bring you to truth. And with my, my walk with God, and this is me, and it can be for anybody, um, then God will make sure that you come to the knowledge of truth because truth sets people free, right? And people are looking for truth. And so I was telling Helen, I says, Lord, dear, I, I've, I was saved, and this is beyond my notes there, but I was saved through uh, uh, Jack Van, you know, prophetic. I was in prophecy, and I, I was watching TV, smoking dope, drinking rye, and I, I asked the Lord to come into my life. My life changed supernaturally, but I was always interested in prophecy. And uh, I'll just give you a nugget. <laughs> About you go to Book of Revelation. Everybody has their own mindset about who the Antichrist is. <laughs> well, I have my own mindset. And I, I want to make sure that I, I'm saying that. But I went there again yesterday because I heard a minister. And he says it's going to be a man and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's going to come from here. But they don't pay attention to what John says in the Book of Revelation because in John... John says very clearly that person was dead, was not alive when he was talking. When he was, when John, 2,000 years, he's on the Isle of Patmos, he said the beast there was not alive. So that means the one that's going to be the Antichrist, live in the past, he's going to come alive again. I'm just going to give you that. There's three places he talks about that. The, the wound, I was, he was fatally wounded there. He was, fatal means dead. And there's three places. If you pay attention, you, you read it very slowly, you will realize the Antichrist, it doesn't seem to be, uh, I'll leave it at that. He might just be, well, I'll just leave it back. He might just be uh, half angels and half, God, uh, half man. I don't know. Like Nimrod. Or Gilgamesh, I'm just saying. But uh, why would why would the people say who can come against him? Meaning this person will be like, you know. Anyway, I'm just saying this because you know some somehow Bible experts they don't seem to see that. And so the Spirit of God sometimes will, you know. I may be wrong. Maybe I challenge you to go in the Word and seek it out yourself, right? But I'm telling you. God wants truth to be exposed. He always wants. And sometimes, you know, you might say, well, I'm just a simple little Jojo, you know. Uh, I'm a simple little Christian, and why would I get a revelation like that? And some big, huge Bible experts, you know, they're not getting, well, hey, are you honest with God? Do you really want to know the truth? Because God will share it. Anyway, that's beyond my notes. Thank you for being here this morning. Hopefully you got what I believe the Spirit of God wants us to understand is that there's a force behind the scene in us, and, but Jesus is, has a greater force to be able to overcome sin. And sin, to be a genuine believer, you will always have that thing behind you trying to take over, and you say no. Uh, so you, you die to the flesh and live for Christ. Amen? Amen? So Father, I just thank you for the people watching. I thank you for the people here in the church and Thank you for the people watching, Lord God. I pray that you, uh, whatever this, hopefully this message has uh, equipped people, also changed people. And uh, if I'm speaking, Lord, to anyone behind this camera, 
or even listening on audio podcasts that haven't made Jesus Lord and Savior, I pray that He will. That you are genuine, that you're real. I pray that they will get born again and understand what I've been talking and what it is to, tr to become a true, genuine believer. I pray this with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.